So firstly, thank you so much for having me once again. This is my third time here. Uh, and I do think this is just one of the most inspiring things that we get to do at any point in our year. And I think we've all heard uh, some incredibly inspiring stuff. Um, we've heard some depressing stuff, thank you, Michelle. Um, but I think that we, I feel as though there is a real commitment for us to come together and address uh, some of the challenges that we are facing. Um, so I have two mighty women here uh, to have a discussion about creativity, which is my favorite subject, how we could be using creativity more for policy change. So thank you so much, Lilia, for joining us, and Talia. Um, what I'd like to do, just to start with, um, is make my pitch, I suppose, for creativity, uh, because I think I feel it is an under-leveraged tool uh, in, our, in our quest for equality and an under-leveraged tool in changing policy. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I think the opportunity is right now. Uh, I was meant to be joined by my partner in crime, uh, Devika, who is the CEO of Ogilvy, one of the world's largest advertising agencies, also part of the WPP group, uh, which Landor is part of. Sadly, she couldn't join us. She was so gutted. She did make us a short film um, where she's going to talk about some examples of work that she's been involved in uh, where we have been using creativity uh, to help change policy. Uh, and then I will have a discussion with these two fine women. Um, so the first thing that I really want to talk about, we were brilliantly set up from the previous session, all about popular culture. Uh, the creative industry, as I think we all know, brilliant storytellers doing some amazing work to put equality on the agenda in popular culture. So what you're looking at there, Pose, a television show, really shining a light on the transgender challenges. Uh, we've already talked about Barbie. Um, I'll draw your attention to the last example, though, uh, which is obviously a branded piece of content from Nike, again, uh, designed to promote equality. So there is a, there, there is a huge community of people available to us that are telling great stories that are going to help us drive equality. And I think what we're seeing within WPP, we work with so many brands around the world, um, brands have really embraced the notion of purpose, of positioning themselves as socially good, and it's really critical to brands to succeed that they are perceived in that way uh, because we're certainly seeing that consumer preference is being driven by issues of social good. So we see that in the younger audiences that buy brands that are socially good, but we're also seeing it within the talent pools. So younger people will only work for good businesses. So that's the second point that I want to make. And the third point is this. The brands that we work with, the data sources that we've seen, brands are going to spend a trillion dollars on commercial creativity next year. And we've heard a lot about the need to fund initiatives to promote equality. And when we know that brands want to position themselves as socially good, and we know they've got a trillion dollars to spend in promoting their cause, then I suppose our premise is there's a huge opportunity right now to bring brand owners, the creative industry, and many of you find policy makers, the global policy community together to collaborate on policy change. And I think I'll, 
I did just want to highlight that the world of commercial creativity has dramatically changed. We heard a little bit about that in the previous panel, but we have many ways to use commercial creativity to connect with people. So yes, there's advertising. Yes, there's branded content. We saw that with Barbie. But our industry is very heavily vested in understanding how to unlock influencer and social marketing. And we've been using those channels very successfully on behalf of brands. I think our view is and our hope is that we can take all that knowledge and help influence policy. So I just want to, <laughs> you clap. Um, because the mighty Devika couldn't be here, I did just want to play a quick film uh, featuring her thoughts and some of the examples uh, of her work. I'm going to share three examples with you. The first one is here, the girl. The little girl who stood across the starting room downtown in Manhattan as an international symbol of equality on corporate boards. It was done by safety global advisors who used their proxy voting rights to get more women on corporate boards. So can creativity actually change corporate policy? I'm glad to say yes, it can. Because there are more women on corporate boards today than there were in 2070. But more importantly, not just the absolute numbers, the movement to get more women on corporate boards is a live entity. This next idea is based on a simple, simple, simple fact that corporations in the American Constitution have more rights than the women do. And the Equal Rights Amendment, a hundred year old initiative in the United States, has still not passed. I mean, it has kind of infuriated, and I think we should all be in ways and that we live. Uh, in the US, and if you don't live in the US, it should be enraged for women in the US. We took that back and we amplified it using humor to actually stop talking about it, discussing it, to take it to to be enraged so that we can put pressure on uh, the government. There's another simple fact. African American women are discriminated in the workplace for their hair. Because the company that's straight ahead has more advantages in the world of it. What we did with Dove, and if you're not familiar with Dove, what Dove does, it takes on beauty standards, the wrong beauty standards, the beauty standards that, that discriminate against people, the beauty standards that create body shaming, the beauty standards that make women feel lesser of themselves. And with Dove, we initiated a crown hair act to end discrimination based on hair in the world. And I'm very happy to tell you that in 23 states, the Brown Hair Act is now alive and has been passed, putting an end to hair discrimination. A classic example of when a business takes on an issue and amplifies it using creativity. I'm so sorry I can be with you guys um, today, but next year I'll be back. Let's change the world. Wonderful, Devika. Um, so look, I mean, you can tell that we at WPP are huge believers that creativity can make a difference and that brands uh, are primed to help support the mission that we're on. Um, but I want to start with you, Lilia, since you are obviously a critical policy maker. What role do you think creativity and brands could play in the work that you're doing? It can play a huge role, uh, and I also first want to kind of thank the uh, uh, this forum for initiating this whole discussion among women and how powerful and this year's uh, forum is terrific. So I just you know big applause to you guys. Um, we are in the age of creativity and social media. And what is new is that we have, to a certain extent, it has been, uh, there is, a, to a certain degree, a greater democracy taking place because there are, there are uh, uh, many, many ways how you approach an individual today than you did only like 15 years ago, as you know. You basically have to uh, address 
uh, basically the same campaign through different channels, and you need to use creativity to do that. I can name uh, um, a very uh, example that we're doing right now here in Iceland. I'm the Minister of the Language, the, uh, the Icelandic. And what we see, there is a, there's a huge influence of the English, English language into our uh, language. And to a certain extent, it's understandable, but you can really you know, change the language unless that you are you know, taking care of it. And what we're doing now, we are launching a campaign through creativity and putting basically all the slangs, you say slangs, slettur, all the, you know, the way we talk into a written uh, language in a funny way, we think, in order to, you know, ask people, do we want this in the future? So we had a, we were working with a, you know, with a, a company, advertisement company, uh, and this is what we're going to do for the next couple of months. Basically, you know, be pro, uh, you know, challenge people. Do we want their language to be developed in this way? So we use this, uh, especially for causes that are not very controversial. I mean, you can't do it if you're in politics. You need to focus on something that you know that there's a very broad support. Uh, we've done this when we were promoting... Uh, actions in order to make uh, education more interesting for teachers and sh very successful and using creativity and uh, sense of humor. That's amazing. So you, you've had a lot of success uh, using creativity to change behavior and change attitudes. Um, Talia, you've obviously had a different sort of a background. What, what's your view on the role that creativity can play? I mean, clearly it, it can change behavior. Do you believe it could change policy too? I do. Um, I come from the nonprofit sector. Um, I've also been a lawyer in private practice, and I've both worked at and, and seen um, as a grant maker and as a consultant so many um, women's rights nonprofits um, struggling. I, you know, we've been talking for two days now, so we know that the road ahead has many challenges. It's long and it's hard. And we need all of the allies that we can get we have to use every tool in the toolbox in order to achieve gender equality, in order to get to the four E's. Um, you know, the, the panel before <clears throat> talked about the power of storytelling, um, and I think that, you know, many of us already know how important storytelling is to sort of changing hearts and minds. The statistics show that in order to actually get people to act, it isn't learning something, it's feeling something that actually gets people to act. So, and, and, and that kind of emotion, those stories, to do that well, partnerships with creative industries, advertising agencies, brand companies, filmmakers are absolutely necessary. The, the nonprofit, the vast majority of nonprofits are terribly under-resourced. Very few of them have sophisticated communications departments. And in the Global South and among grassroots groups, you know, may, maybe the, you know, CEO also does communications, maybe the fundraiser does, you know, maybe they're, you know. So these kinds of partnerships are, are absolutely key to um, increasing the capacity of, of, of the nonprofit sector. And I do think from a, uh, a leader of a creative business, um, supporting NGOs, supporting anybody who is trying to create a better society is enormously inspiring for our people. So, you know, I mean, if I haven't already made it clear, we are open for business. We are here to help and support. Um, and I just think, I suppose, my question is, why do you think that we are not 
unlocking these alliances? What are the barriers to us being able to better support uh, all of you fine policymakers? What could we do to, to, to help you more? I think that uh, when we were, for instance, if I can mention the, um, uh, when we were encouraging younger people to uh, encourage them to enroll into the teacher's college, which was a huge challenge because we had seen uh, like a 70, 70 percent drop in the enrollment. And we saw, I'm just going to name this as an example. So we saw that we would have a shortage of teachers in Iceland in 2032. And no minister of education want to, wants to be responsible for that. So we basically had a very clear objective. The objective was to increase the enrollment of young people into the teacher's college. But we also had very clear uh, actions that we would take to support that. We had an alliance with the University of Iceland, which is responsible for the education. We were in alliance with uh, some companies that had good reputation that supported us. Uh, and we introduced very clearly what we were doing. And we had like a group of maybe seven entities, nonprofit companies, very well known uh, brands in Iceland. And with this clear vision, we had a result of, I think, 126 percent increase just in about a period of nine months. And we solved this issue. Well, we did it with, you know, a clear and good alliance with both companies, with branding and with uh, storytelling. You know, we had interviews with, you know, uh, influ people that were influencing others, uh, asking them why this is important. So we got a really strong momentum in society for the greater good of, mm -hmm. uh, of the whole thing. So I think this is, you know, I don't think this is really problematic if you're just, it's clear message, simple objective, uh, and it's a benign subject. I mean, you can't do this with everything. I'm not going to name some of these things that you can't do it with, but you know what I mean. But I do think, I, I hope we all think that there is opportunity um, to create more conversation between the creative industry, the brand owners, and the policy makers, because I think everything we heard from Michelle and all the conversations we've been having, we've got to unlock the door to more productive conversations. We do, we do. I, you know, it's, I think that you were asking about barriers earlier and, you know, I, what's going on in the corporate sector and the focus on speaking out for social good is actually relatively new. And, you know, the credit goes to the generation of, of women younger than me. You know, I have, you know, I have no desire to sort of dredge up the past, but there was a time when the corporate sector, you know, wasn't, it didn't have particularly friendly policies or advertising and so on um, towards women. Um, but I do think that recognizing that that has changed, um, not not dwelling on the past, but actually marshalling, you know, what, what this generation of young w women are demanding, as you mentioned, as employees, because there's a war for talent out there in virtually every industry. Um, and as consumers, as you also mentioned, and we, you know, we really, we need to, to marshal that um, in order to make sure, well, for those issues that are not already mainstream, to put them in the mainstream, um, and for those issues where we're backsliding, <laughs> you know, to keep fighting. Um, and I have seen some, 
you know, some alliances that are very surprising. Um, Vital Voices, a women's rights organization, um, has partnered with Queen Latifah's um, film production company called Film uh, Queen Collective um, to create stories of some of the fellows and and you know incredible frontline grassroots women who are in the Vital Voices network, and it's sponsored by Procter and Gamble. Yeah. Procter and Gamble makes bounty paper towels and Tampax and all sorts of other things. I mean, they're a huge conglomerate. Um, they have recognized that women are buying their products, women are working at their companies, and they better start supporting women. I couldn't agree more, and we're seeing that. And I do hope that we can do more to support in this area. Devika and I have committed to identifying five policy changes that we can use our design and advertising resources against in five years. Uh, I've cornered Michelle. Michelle has agreed that she will help make those efforts measurable. So if anybody wants to connect with us, please do. Um, but huge thank you uh, to you guys. Um, I'd love to just run a quick film while we leave the stage, just as evidence of creativity at work to change policy. I'm Gabriella Pizzolo, and as a newly legal adult woman in America, I gotta say, it's not awesome here. You see, I was under the silly impression that as a woman, I had the same rights as men. But it turns out that for the last 100 years, women have been trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment recognized so we could be protected under the Constitution. But our government is always like, LOL, no thanks. There is one thing our government loves to protect. Corporations are people, my friend. That's right, corporations. Hi, Joel. As a legal scholar, tell me, is it true that under the Constitution, companies are considered persons, which grants them rights and protections? Yes, that's exactly right. And in the past few years, would you say corporations' rights have been expanding? Very much so. And it's safe to say that women's rights have been... Declining. Wonderful. So any company I can think of is more likely to have the government fight to protect its rights than to protect me. Technically, yes. Gas stations, movie theaters, European wax chains. Even the company that makes those little testicles for pickup trucks? Unfortunately, yes. Truck nuts are more deserving of protections than every single woman in America. More than Dolly Parton? This gem of a woman? Truck nuts. Dolly. I'm so sorry, Dolly. So if that's true, I could hypothetically create a corporation and name it woman, and the government would care more about protecting woman the corporation than this woman sitting right here. Yes, but I feel like- Aw, feelings. No time for that. I've got a corporation to form. So to form a corporation, all I have to do is pay a hundred bucks, file the paperwork, hire a board of directors, have that board of directors hold one single meeting, and voila! Woman Corp is a company. Welcome to Woman Corp, a corporation built on years of oppression and deep, deep institutional sexism. Oh, I love that one. Because apparently, you need a giant logo in front of a giant bush in a giant fucking bill. Oh, and a printer. Weird. Who left this here? and a smug CEO. All to create Woman Corp, the one woman in America that the government will fight to protect because it's a corporation and not a woman. One woman down, only 170 million actual women to go. Not interested in creating an entire corporation just to get basic human rights? Then help us get the Equal Rights Amendment recognized in the Constitution. Because this is fucking bullshit. Hello? Is this the senator's office? Oh good, I have a few things to say. 